Well, this seems like we're back live on WVON to celebrate the last day of this year's official Black History Month and um, day. But yet we could continue to celebrate Black culture, Black um, excellence every day of our lives just by being us. And today, let me say I'm LaShawn Ford and I'm state representative. And our other guests are. Or even fellows. And Malika Gardner. She's muted and we can't hear, but she's going to. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Malika Gardner here. Yes. Uh, Black History Month went really fast, didn't it? It did. But you know what? <laughs> I feel I feel like every year is it gets better and better. What you think, Brother Reva? I say Black History 365. That's Black what I'm talking about. 365. Yeah, you know, and we don't, I mean, it's just, I think, just like Christmas is not just one day, it's a season, and we believe as Catholics that it's a season, you know, and we don't need a calendar to help us be excellent and to showcase Black history, as Reva said, and our guest today will uh, display why, um, um, black history is something that three that's 365 days. But before we get started, it's important to know that today is the anniversary of a tragic day in history. On February 26, 2012, Trevon Martin, an African-American teen, was walking home from a trip to the convenience store and was fatally shot by a man, killed by a man, and I dare not say his name because he's not in jail. He's walking around. And our dear um, young man, Trevon Martin, that was 17 at the time, would be 27, probably finishing law school or something right now. Instead, he's buried. And so if we can just ask our good friend Titus to let's play the clip in honor of Trevon Martin. He was 17 years old. He was unarmed, and a 28-year-old man followed him, chased him, pursued him, and ultimately shot and killed him. Trayvon Martin's death birthed a movement, but a decade later, his mother's emotions remain raw. On my bad days, 10 years later, I still cry. A reluctant activist, Sabrina Fulton, is still fighting in his name. I would never have signed up for this. Um, but by the same token, I feel like what I'm doing is with a purpose. Trayvon Martin was just 17 years old when he was confronted by George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch volunteer, as the teenager, wearing a hoodie, walked home from a store with a bag of Skittles. After an argument and a brief struggle, Martin was shot dead. Zimmerman argued self-defense, and a jury found him not guilty. It marked the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. The hashtag appeared on social media for the first time after Zimmerman's acquittal, giving rise to a new generation of activists like Philip Agnew. What did that moment do for you? Uh, it was an alarm clock. People just couldn't take it anymore. In 2012, Martin's death shocked Agnew into action. He started organizing with friends, a three-day march across Florida, a sit-in at the state capitol. Before Trayvon Martin's death, did you consider yourself an activist? I considered myself an activist in my free time, and it didn't become a central part of who I identified myself as until 2012. It created organizers, it created activists, um, not just in the United States, but around the world. Since then, year after year, more names and more mothers left to grieve. Sabrina founded Circle of Mothers and stands as a living example. They can make it too. I want to just tell them to keep breathing and keep walking. This week's guilty verdicts in the deaths of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery give her hope. Progress, she says, but not enough. It also is very uh, bittersweet because it hurts that we had to lose lives in order to get to that point. You continue to be at the front of protests and leading these events. What keeps you there? I have to be the voice for my son who's no longer here. I have a son in heaven and a son here on earth, and I want to make both boys proud. 
Now, even 10 years later, Savannah, there are two things that so many people associate with the night that Trayvon Martin died. The hoodie that he was wearing and the bag of Skittles that he was carrying. Well, those both of those items, among others, are now publicly on display at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. His mother donated those items, and I asked her, was it painful for her to make those things public? She said, absolutely. It's something that she prayed over for about three years, but she said, ultimately, I've already given my son to America, and now I want to give these items so that future generations will know her son's name. Savannah. Ten years, Blaine. Thank you very much. Now that is in honor of wow. Javon Martin, and I, I would like to invite our guests to, before we get started talking about um, Black history, this has become a part of American history. It's uh, The death of Trevon Martin is a part of Americans' history. And even after, 10 years after Trevon Martin has been killed, America's disdain for Black men and boys hasn't diminished in the years since he uh, was killed. And today, I believe, and Malika and Reven, we all believe that if we can just get our story told right, some of that culture, the real rich culture, the disdain for Black men and boys, could be dealt with. Before we get started on on the 360, you guys, let's start with um, Reven and then Malika, and then Malika, when you can introduce our guests so that they can um, give honor and tribute to Trevon before we get started on 360. Okay. Reven? Well, I just <laughs> want to say, man, um, it's... Um, History is really something it, it shows, you know, from Emmett Till to Gina Six to Trayvon Martin. And next month, uh, we'll look at Rakia Boyd also. But it's just um, uh, it's tragic that we don't get justice for young men. And I think that has created the disdain of hope. These young men not getting justice and uh, feeling a certain type of way. So I just... Uh, when do we be respected as a race of people and when do we demand justice for our children is my statement. We have to get some justice for our children so they can we have hope for the future. Yes, yes. And and I remember ooh, that day years ago, um, that was the first march I ever participated in that I, I was out there protesting um, George Zimmerman. Um, we were holding up Trayvon Martin and um, his passing was was monumental for for a lot of people because it it didn't wake us up because we knew we, I mean we have family members who have been Trayvon Martins we know Trayvon Martins um, but it was the first where I was really moved to get to get active and um, his his passing just I mean I didn't know him personally but I cried I absolutely cried it, it I don't know something about when certain people pass, it, it really touches the soul, the spirit, and it just fires you up to, to take action. But um, we have two guests here today. Um, Rep Ford had told me about the Black History 365, and, and I looked them up, and it got me so excited because of their mission, what it is that they do. And I have so many questions for them, and I know others will have questions for them as well. But Bernard Turner uh, took the time to uh, send me information, and <laughs> I know I've been like a pain <laughs> to him with, with all my emails and questions and things, and, um, and thank you to Dr. Walter Milton for uh, joining us today. I'm glad that uh, you are available to uh, join us, so I can't wait for this discussion to get started because we've worked on legislation around Black history and how important it is. And um, I, I truly believe that if people really knew who Black people were to this world, not just to this country, but to the world, our contributions were the original people on the planet, then we wouldn't have situations like Trayvon Martin because there will be a respect level because we, were the, we are the original man. So without further ado, I want to bring on Dr. Walter Milton Jr. and Bernard Turner of Black History 365. Thank you, Malika. And if you guys could just respond to um, the tribute to Trevon, and then we will um, bring you on with your um, with your mission. 
Uh, yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I'm in uh, the state of Louisiana. Um, I've been a keynote speaker all week in the state, and tomorrow is my culminating event. Um, I'll be, I'm, I'm in Shreveport, um, and so I'm speaking at a large church here. But I just wanted to just talk about Trayvon uh, in a very special way. I just uh, completed a book um, called A Matter of Life or Death, Why Black Men Must Save Black Boys in America. And Cleveland Metropolitan School District had invited me to come to present there to about 2,500 black boys. And unfortunately, the day of my arrival, Trayvon was just murdered. And um, I thought that it was customary in his honor to have a hoodie on. And I told the young men that I was going to turn my back to them. And I asked them a question. I said, how many of you are Trayvon Martin? And when I turned around, I said, please stand. And every young man was standing. And it was so riveting that it, it just brought immediate tears to everyone's eyes, all the adults that were there. And if you really think about it, um, you know, this is not a flaw in our system for us to be in this situation. It's the design of the system. And I think that we have to really find ways to um, deconstruct, reconstruct and construct methods to really demonstrate to our young men and our young ladies that they are, they, they are great. They are descendants literally from Kings and Queens. I mean, we are some of the oldest people in the universe and our history goes all the way back to the beginning of time. Mr. Bernard. Yes. I would like to re, you know, really reemphasize that because I work not only with young people in classrooms, but I also work with senior citizens who've told me we don't hear about these things or we didn't hear about them in school. So we have to rededicate ourselves to working with young people. And that's what I really spend a lot of my time doing. And we have to honor the people like um, Trayvon Martin's parents for carrying on the, the battle that they're fighting right now. So I I agree with Dr. Milton as well. You know, why Black History 365? I'm going to read something from your um, excerpts from your website. It says, unfortunately, Black students in particular are contending with emotions they may find difficult to articulate. Black students are fighting forces that were strategically established to maintain academic neutrality, while other students have significantly more opportunities to excel because they are exposed to the contributions of their ancestors daily, celebrating their history, culture, and existence throughout history textbooks and society at large. According to research regarding culturally responsive teaching and learning, there is a direct correlation between student self-awareness and academic achievement. There is an obvious need for Black American students to achieve in the same manner than culturally astute matters. This lack of historic content has been significantly influencers of negative outcomes for Black students and communities, including a lack of self-awareness, lack of self-esteem, lack of intrinsic motivation, decrease in academic achievement, truancy, discipline, referrals, criminal activities, prison sentence, and debt. And you talk about all students, and not only Black students, but white students need to know all history as well. And you talk about the fact that educators must be educated properly. So Mm -hmm. what do you say about, you know, the image that America had of Trayvon Martin with the hoodie on walking in the neighborhood? Does that have anything to do with? 
the way Trevon Martin was seen because of the culture that America has betrayed us. Well, um, Bernard, um, do you mind if I go first or would you like Please to? Sure. Please do. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that had it been anyone that shared the same hue as Trayvon Martin had, the outcome would have been similar. I really think that if for some reason or another, you know, hate There's, is not... We should mute if we're not talking. Yeah, hate is not the opposite of love. Fear is the opposite. And I think that oftentimes it proposes uh, proposes a, a challenge because of the fear. And then after the fear comes the hate. And I really think that that's where this gentleman had acted upon his fear and his hatred. And, and ignorance. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so um, let, let's see, how does, um, how, how does the book 360 prepare teachers and students to confront difficult topics such as assurance policies that were sold for enslaved people, the N-word, critical race theory? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Those are loaded questions, but, you know, we're ready for it. And we, we're going to give you guys a chance to really talk about what... Um, Three. Um, so why don't we go there first? Tell us about three sixty. Why three sixty? Um, let me. Anyway, let me share this with you. You see how thick it is. It's yes. one thousand two hundred and forty-eight pages, and believe it or not, it still did not cover everything. We could have easily had about five, six thousand pages of our history. You know, what I discovered is that we have a gene that no one else has. It's called the best gene. And whatever <laughs> we do, we're going to be the best at it. Um, if it's things that we're, that, that's bad, we're going to be the best at that. <laughs> things that are good, <laughs> we're going to be the best at that. We have a gene that no one else has. And I really think it took that kind of gene to come to America to build America. Because our ancestors literally built this country. And we need to understand that. So let me tell you how we really came about. If you guys can indulge me for a few yeah, minutes, I'll make please. it really quick. So I grew up in New York, and I was um, a student at a school uh, that was a magnet school. And so I would have to catch a bus and go over the bridge and all of that stuff. So I had a teacher named Miss Laudisi, and she said to us one day that tomorrow we're going to learn Black history. So I was really excited. I was like, whoa. You know, my mother and father, I consider them revolutionaries to this day because they would always say that our history goes back to the beginning of time. And so I was like, wow, I can sit in the front row. I can answer some questions because I know a lot. But what I did not know that she was going to start the lesson off with the film strip. And the first thing that I saw was a so-called slave master beating an enslaved person. And what it did, it ushered so much shame, humiliation, and anger in me that I was fighting myself for not going into a rage because it contradicted everything that my mother and father were saying. So she literally was saying that this is where our history started. So I went home, I was upset, and I, I was really, really, I mean, when I tell you I was present that day, I had my favorite blue suit on, my snap-on tie. But let me bring clarity to that blue suit. That was the only suit I had. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so I sat there dressed up and I went home and told my mother and father what had happened. And I said, you know, you guys told me that we were kings and queens and, you know, everything. And, and th- this teacher said, and the, my mother said, you know, one day you're going to be able to tell that story. You're going to be able to do that. So I became a school superintendent. I started my career in New York at, at a, at a predominantly um, so-called Jewish district. I was there for three years and I went to Flint, Michigan as superintendent. And then I was in Springfield, Illinois as superintendent, the first black superintendent, um, youngest and the highest paid ever. And so I was there for eight years and my eight year, my mother called me and I'm like, Oh mama, you know, whatever my mother said, what happened? As soon as you start making predictions over your life, it was going to happen. So she said, you know, you're being called for something greater. The great, the creator is calling you for something greater. And you're going to have to quit your job as superintendent and do 
what you have to do. And I'm like, oh, please, Mo. No, I love being here, blah, 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 building new schools. And lo and behold, my mother said, I may be dead and gone, but you're going to see what I'm talking about. And unexpectedly, my mother died that week. Mm-hmm. She, um, it just broke my heart. I was the youngest, so at the bottom of eight kids, and and I just lost my father. I had two nieces that died in a fire, lost my brother. And I'm like, man, my whole world was just caving in. So I decided to resign, and people thought that I was crazy. So I started my company. The company was doing really well. Um, and, but it was still something missing. And one night I just started writing. I started thinking about my mom and that story, my experience of the fourth grade entered my mind and my mother's words were clear as day. She said, you're going to be able to, to, to write this story. And I just started writing and I started writing and I started writing and I started researching, looking at Afrocentric history, looking at Eurocentric history. And I called a gentleman that I've known for uh, some years and he had images that people have never seen before of our people. Um, the oldest image dates back to 1553. So I invited him. I was living in Nashville, Tennessee at the time. Hey, would you come in and, and, and talk to me? Let's see your images. Let's see if we can start a partnership with your images and this incredible work. And he said, yeah, and he's a, he's a Caucasian male. I call him John Brown sometimes, but he's a former chaplain of the Washington Wizards. So he came and, we said, we're going to partner with these images and this book. And we started writing. And people thought I was crazy when I was talking about the vision. It took us almost three years, 12 to 16 hour days. And all of the lies, all of the untruths, all of the things from our belief system to, to everything was just a lie. And so we said that we're going to do something that has never been done before. And the creator did bless me. My mother told me. I have 70 great people, Bernard being one of them. And Bernard is a brother that I've known for many years. When I asked him to come on board, he said, yes, everyone did. And we're the first that I know black owned company positioned the way that we're positioned. Well, we need to talk about it, but we, we, we only have a short period of time. Okay. Okay. To get to black history as it is. You it's know, all, this is all, yeah, this is all a part of it. I can't talk about it if I don't get the foundation. It so sounds, the sounds it's great, but we let yeah. us go first to the call. He's been waiting. I understand that it's all a part. Um, let's go to Frank, um, for a call. Frank, okay, okay. Hello, good afternoon, Representative Ford, Malik, and all y'all. Great topic. How y'all doing? Good, Frank. Yeah. Hey, listen, um. I'm just going to say it like this, you know what I'm saying? Um, Trayvon Martin was a tragedy, okay, his death. We all know that. But Trayvon Martin was victimized long before he um, met George Zimmerman. And I'm going to tell you why, okay? Um, if Trayvon Martin was where God ordained to see the Father's for remain, Trayvon Martin would still be alive today. To see the Father's will remain with the Father it is a tragedy. Trayvon Martin was a stranger in his own father's neighborhood. He was a stranger on his own father block. Okay? Whenever we go against what God ordained, the end result right. is going to be chaos. George Simmons and Trayvon would have known each other. Okay? A domino effect is taking place in our community because we're going against what God ordained. Thank you so very much. Now, of course, uh, you know, this is, we, we know that this is um, a deep story and at, at getting here, but I think that what we need more than anything right now is to tell why 360. I understand that there was the birthing of it and how is your teaching different than any other teachings that we see in our schools? Absolutely. That's a great question. Brother, uh, Mr. Ford, um, we started ancient Africa. Oftentimes, many textbooks start in slavery or the civil rights movement or what have you. But we go all the way back. We look at the etymology of the word Africa, and it takes us to a Kubalon, which takes us to the Garden of Eden, where life first started. So that's our starting point. We come all the way up to contemporary times past George Floyd, and we talk about that connectivity. Then we have QR codes that um, people can use, technology devices, cell phones, iPads, or what have you to really bring about a plethora of information. 
Then we have images that um, people never seen before. Our oldest image, like I said, goes back to 1553. And one of the things that really crystallized the book is that we have music that goes to it. Um, the producer for Jay-Z, T.I., Drake, Snoop Dogg, um, he did our music for us. We have 41 amazing songs that really connect to each one of the chapters and units of the book. So we wanted to do something that people never experienced before. Um, we have our textbook in many school districts across the country, many colleges and universities. And it's just our way of just spreading hope, you know, to this land. And I believe that things like critical race theory and uh, that you spoke of and those kinds of things really don't even align themselves with what we're trying to do. And every day we're growing. And I believe that, you know, God has his fingerprints all over this work. Yeah. So your history lessons, are your history lessons inclusive or is it focused on black history? Because, you know, it's my belief that American history is, um, is inclusive of the real story. And it's yeah. hard to separate black history from American history. It's Absolutely. How, Absolutely. How, how do you, how do you uh, reconcile that? Man, that's a great question. And so if you look at the book, it's, it's black history and inclusive account <laughs> of American history. Thank you. <laughs> so the subtitle tells it all. And that really underscores the book. It's an inclusive account of American history. You can't talk about American history if you don't talk about our history. Our history is not an out-of-the-bounds history, out-of-the-stadium history. It is an intimate part of American history woven in the fabric of this, of this country here. You know, not many people, Malika, understand that, right, Malika? <laughs> right. A lot of people do not understand that. Um, let me tell you, it was people, uh, legislators who were totally against what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, well, of course, always funding is always an issue. Whenever it comes to us, there's lack of funding. So it's a question, well, how are we going to fund this? And if we do it for the black community, then we'll have to do it for everybody else. And Rep. Ford said, well, why wouldn't you do it for everybody else? But then the other reason they didn't want to pass teaching pre-enslavement, who we were prior to being terrorized and enslaved, was that the teachers wouldn't have the training. You would have teachers who wouldn't want to teach this. And then you had teachers who would have to be trained on that. So how do you all... Uh, uh, address that because that's so have, that's that's their big argument oh yeah and, and you're <laughs> right um but one of the things like texas uh they made it mandatory that every state every school in the in the state has to teach black history and so we are in a number of schools in texas illinois the same kind of thing um that allows us to come in we're in a number of districts in the state of illinois actually proviso or chicago just did a story on us and what our curriculum is doing in that school district. Right. And um, Bernard is part of the um, professional see. development team where he would go, um, and we have about 50 members of our team that go into schools to train teachers how to effectively use our, our, our um, textbooks as a tool. And we have textbooks from third grade all the way through the college level. And so we believe that it's important to train those people. And so funding is really important. That's why we did our homework. We wanted to make sure that we had research to give us a, a valid argument that when kids are exposed to this type of work, they do better academically. And, it, and the results are starting to happen. Yeah, Reven, I mean, Reven, you know the Shaw brothers and all of the um, people that were fighting to make sure that Black history is taught. It's the law of the land in Illinois that we teach Black history. And uh, Brother Reed, what what have you your experience? You were a teacher too. Well, I've experienced that. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, my experience. The, we don't stand up for who we are and what we represent. And you can't tell any history without black people. And we consider just like Trayvon Martin, we led with the show. We continue to be disrespected and neglected, and we don't really stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and really put up the legit argument that there's no justice, no peace, and we need justice. So uh, I just can't see how we can be 
in a town where we just got John Baptiste Dusabo name on a highway, and he founded Chicago, the government, the, the law, and we're just getting around to 2022 to make this thing happen. So somehow we have to take pride, just like the Jews say, never again, never forget. We try to not remember, and we try not, we try to forget. And when that happens, other people will steal your history, tell your story, and disrespect your history. That's exactly right. Uh, Brother yes. Reed, I know Dr. Milton wants to chime in at Bernard, but we have to go to Karen. She's a friend of the show, and we want Karen to come on in and pay tribute to Black History Month our good um, soldier here, um, Trevon Martin. Well, first of all, let me give you all kudos, kings and queens, because this is the most important show that I've heard for the whole month of Black History Month, because we've been taught to teach slavery, and we were somebody before slavery. And that's why I march with courage and confidence because my parents taught me to study who we were before we became enslaved. And just like that gentleman is saying, a lot of people are not going to go for that, because once you know who you are, you'll know what you have to do. And right now, we don't know who we are. That's why we're hanging on to red and blue. They teach us to do red and blue instead of knowing who you were. So, sir, your mother was right. Your mother was right. Because until we know who we were before we became enslaved, it's never going to change. This is what we need in our community. Know who you were. We are the world. Everything derives from us. But if we're not told and we're just labeled as people that were enslaved, we're never going to wake up. So this is one of the greatest shows for Black History Month because in order to conquer, you must confront. And you got to confront and understand that we are kings and queens. Nothing less, but even more. Love you. Thank you for this show. Thank you, sir. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for that, that, Karen. Dr. Milton has to go right at it. Um, You know, Dr. Milton, I know you wanted to say something. Oh, no, no. That that sister was on the money because that's the truth. And Brother Revan is a raven and raven, but that was on the money as well, man. I I don't know you, but, man, my heart is just, wow. You know, we have to have courage. You know, we have to kill the fear mechanisms. And we have to understand that those were emotions that we we learn we learn those things because we came over here as proud proud descendants of of, of kings and queens but we were taught you know through this 400 years of victimization and genocide we were taught this type of behavior not to trust each other not to love each other not to protect each other not to not to help each other not to spend our dollar with each other those are all learned behaviors and they are opposite of who we really are. They're opposite of our true culture. And what we have to do is reconnect and, and embrace our past and who we really are because they know, they know who we are. They know that we're God's people. They know that we're powerful. They know if mm-hmm. they would destroy who we are, they can do exactly what they've done to us. But we're waking up now. This is a, a way, awakening. Look at the conversation that we're having today. Look at you, Brother Ford for even having the courage to have this incredible conversation, you and Sister Gardner and, and the sister who called. So this is amazing. I'm just elated to be here with you guys today. Let me tell you, let me read something else that you wrote and you and your team wrote. Mm-hmm. You said, educators, we got a message for you. For decades and even centuries, teachers have been encouraged to tell a pretty lopsided story. Although many educators have taken initiative to do and be more inclusive in their delivery of history and social science instructions, there have been few mandates to do so. Educators and decision makers within our system are so influenced by the lack of Black history curriculum and participate in the demise of historically forgotten communities by accepting negative stereotypes, displaying biases, acting on fears of the unknown, refusing to acknowledge the contributions and challenges of Black Americans, not challenging discriminatory behavior, challenging progressive movements that would bring more inclusive history and social studies curriculum. 
that's a lot. What, where were you hitting at? It's clear, but you want to respond? Yes, I do. Well, what we wanted to do was set the context that there was a need for this. And so another thing that we did, um, Brother Ford, is that we did uh, surveys. We went into schools. We started asking kids. We started asking white kids to fill out these surveys. And 92% of the responses that we got, that there's a need for this, we want to learn it. Many, some white kids said that we want to learn it so that we can break the stereotypes, the misconceptions. And our people, our kids just really wanted to do it. We were doing um, a focus group in Little Rock, Arkansas, and a little girl, little sister said, she said, I need to know who I am. Who were we before we got on those ships? These people, the education that we've gotten, they teach you that white people invented air. <laughs> That's said it all to me. <laughs> Hold on, let me tell you guys one thing about it. I'm going to give kudos to Malika. Malika, are you ready? I'm ready. And so Reven, I met Reven in um, when my first year in office. He brought me legislation to make sure that we have what you call the Black Employment Plan. Not a minority employment plan, but a Black Employment Plan. One of the greatest um, parts about being elected officials is being able to listen to people and to be able to work with them to achieve a goal that makes society better. So mm. African-American employment plan is in law because of Reven Fellows. That's a, something we could celebrate for Black History Month. Also, there was Malika. I met her through, and you will like this, Bernard, and, and Milton Reven already knows, but in today in Illinois, because of some work that we did, the brainchild of Malika, the new legislation in Illinois requires schools to teach an expanded version of Black history. Lessons should include periods that predate slavery, dating back to 3000 BCE, and the reason for slavery and the civil rights movement. That's the work of the General Assembly, but the brainchild of Malika Gardner through wow. me as a legislator and the Black Caucus. Thank you, guys. Yes. You know, and and Malika, did you um, what what inspired you as a as a citizen to even think about um, saying we're teaching history, but we're not teaching it right. We need to do this because I had a family who told me otherwise, and then I went to a school where I was the only black kid in the class, and it it it, it was did not feel good. <laughs> It didn't feel good when we only had two pages and here you have Dr. Milton has written a book that should be 5,000 pages and we only got two pages throughout the history book. And what I noticed was that my, my Jewish friends, they, they had their own school that they would go to after general school and learn more about their culture. I had my Greek friends, they had Greek school. I had my Japanese friends, they had Japanese school, but we didn't have anything that tied us to our history, other than what they were teaching in school, which was not correct. And there was so much more to the story. And thank God for my family for for teaching me otherwise. But um, I truly believe that, you know, with all the violence going on, especially here in Chicago, I know it's a lack of self-identity and self-worth and self-knowledge. And if we feed that into not just our black youth, but to all children, there will be, you know, um, better relations between the races because they'll understand that we are the original people and that should come with some respect. But I have had other cultures say, believe that they are the chosen people. And so they don't want this taught. Yeah. But, you know, (laughs) and Dr. Gordon, you know, there's the major push and we've been pushing that you have to teach black history in our schools for years. You, you're a superintendent, you know what the push has been for years. Yes. Teaching black history is important, but you're, you're, you also say, while historically teachers have not been trained to teach history, black history that is, or history. Let me make sure I read it right because you didn't say black history. You said history. While historically teachers have not been trained to teach history, Mm -hmm. Black History 365 offers resources and support to begin to unlearn historic biases 
and teach well-rounded lessons that include and engages all students. Yes, absolutely. Walter, I wanted to mention that in our professional development, one of the things that we do is we help all teachers to recognize not only that they have biases and prejudices, but that the students come in there with biases and prejudices as well. And what you do with one of our uh, features of the book, which is the elephant experience, is to air all of these things Mm -hmm. to be able to look at what you know and what your feelings, what your thoughts, what your biases are before you even get into the material. And you deal with that before you even start reading the lessons. So it's a very powerful way of alleviating those kinds of uh, prejudices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what school districts, right now have adopted your programs in Illinois, um, Dr. Milton? Um, uh, provi- yeah, Proviso. Um, 209. 209, uh, Peoria, Illinois. Um, and there's several others that I don't have in front of me. But uh, uh, Brother Ford, nationally, uh, we have New York City, um, Denver, Colorado. You know, New York City is the largest school system in the nation. We have about 100 and uh, 40, 50 school systems. We have colleges and universities across the country. And every day, our partnerships are really growing. But I believe that this is um, this is our love letter to the world. And I think that this is really designed to bring about a lot of clarity. I mean, we talk about, you know, both political parties and, and, and the deadly dance that we've had with both parties and what that really means to us as a people. We talk about you know, the civil rights movement, but different than anyone has ever learned about it. We talk about the black women who were behind the movement, who were really responsible for things that they never got credit for. And we gave them credit. We gave, we told them about, you know, Martin Luther King camera person who was an informant to the FBI that really reported his every movement. We go behind the scenes. We've unearthed so much information that it would just blow your mind how we've been how we've been believing in distorted truths. You're you're very powerful, um, Dr. Milton. Malika and Reven, we've been talking about this. What is black culture? What is our yes. culture? What is black culture? Is black culture. Is it the rap? Is it is it a combination? What is black culture? <laughs> is it mac and cheese? Is it what what is it? <laughs> I think I think one of the things about us is that we're not a monolithic people. We, you know, going back to that best gene, we we have so many different characteristics. But when I think of our culture, I think of, I think of, of, of us being the reflection of God. And I really think that um, that we are people that have done amazing things and that will continue to do amazing things. And I believe that they really know. Hallelujah. I, I'm sorry for <laughs> Response, but I was holding in. And please don't lose your thought. But you said we are a reflection of God, and that's our culture. But go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love that. Oh. Well, you know, Psalm eighty-two six says it. Uh, we are children of the Most High God, and we have to live up to that. We do. I mean, if we were the, if we, if our ancestors were the first descendants, so that tells you that we're the first people. I told you in the book of Genesis 5, 2, that says that God made he and she and created them and called their name Adam, you know, but we've been thinking of Adam as one person, but Adam was a nation of God's first people. And that's us. You know how powerful your work is? This is, you will know who said this. I encourage every school district throughout the United States to strongly consider adopting comprehensive Black History 365 curriculum as their choice of African-American studies. Andrew Young, civil rights activist and UN ambassador, even. Yes. Wow. And and, and, in the book, Andrew Young is on advisory board. He gave us footage Brother Ford, and when you guys get your books, because I'm going to send them out to you, I just need your addresses. Um, But when you see it, he gave us footage in our QR codes that people have never seen before. And he said, you can never sell this footage outside of BH 365. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. 
if this wow. other person, Ben Watson, NFL Super Bowl champion, I got to get my numbers right. I don't know what number that is, but he said Black History 365 is the comprehensive, holistic text and image K-12 curriculum we have so intensely desired that fills the tremendous void in today's educational enrichment landscape. Oh, so it's been endorsed by some, really, <laughs> some powerful people. Well, it answers the question because, you know, they were like, well, what curriculum? We, we don't have the curriculum for this. I mean, so many excuses. Well, there's no excuse. That's right. <laughs> there's no excuse. Reven, what you think? I mean, I want to know if the textbooks that we have that were written pretty much in Texas, where you all are from, should we throw them out? Should we allow the, the constant proliferation of false history to be taught in our schools? I don't think we need those books anymore because it's a miseducation of not just black people, but all people. All people. I think it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. That's right. They damaged us for generations with yes, misinformation. That's right. <laughs> I would say make sure we preserve the books to make sure it was a lie being told. That, bro, that's so factual. <laughs> you know, one thing about it, and that is you can have your opinions, but there's only one fact. And that's our right. books have not taught us facts. Why don't we go ahead and get some closings from everyone. Jeff, who is Jeff? Jeff has been on with us and, and he hasn't said anything. He didn't say anything about Javon Martin. Jeff, what's up? What's up? What's up, Deshaun? What's up, bro? All right. Thanks for being here. I was, I, 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 I was here. just I was just listening. So, you know, I, I learned more about listening, but it's an exciting conversation. I'm um actually encouraged by the young lady, whoever the kid was, to say, who were we? before the the transatlantic slave trade. That's so phenomenal because we are running at the Chicago Peace Initiative, we're running a program, life skills, but it's identity one oh one. And it's going to it's going to give those answers out to who exactly who we were um before the transatlantic slave trade. Uh and so it's so phenomenal because this is the Lord opened up national identity for his people. So it breathes in excitement. But we it were we were excitement. We, and we're cutting you off right there because we got to let everybody give a closing. But no, give a closing, 30 seconds. Dr. Milton, give a 30 seconds. Reven, Malika, and let's go. All right. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to us today. And what we do, what I do, especially. Only 30 seconds. You're down to 20. 30 seconds. Call us if you need some information about this curriculum and how to implement it in schools. Thank you. Dr. Yes. Milton. Yes, I just want to thank you, Brother Ford and, and Sister Gardner, for having us, and, and Brother uh, Reven. And I just want to say we looked at Afrocentric information, we looked at Eurocentric information, and this book is what you call truth centric. Mm, hey, Brother Reven. I like that. That's right. Let's hey. go. We got it cold oh. up. On the day, the 27th anniversary of the A. Philip Randolph Museum in Chicago, we'll be honoring that history today. And I'm also the co-founder of the African American Heritage Museum and Black Veterans Archive that's in Hammond, Louisiana. Dr. Milder, I got to talk to you because our history goes back and it must go forward. Thank All you right, so much. Let's go. We've got to go. All right. Black History, I want to thank our guests so much. And the next time you encounter racism, just remind them we were the original people on this planet and that needs to be taught. Thank and you. Black people, <laughs> we know that it's stressful being Black. Study your history, be proud of your culture and adopt the real culture. And um, I would recommend during Black History Month, read 1619 Project 365. Thank you yes. so very much, you all, for such a great show. Black History 365, not just February. Absolutely. This has been another um, show on WVON iHeartRadio. Have a great week. And Brother Ford, the books will be on its way on Monday. All right. Thank All you. right. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.